Our text this morning are three verses from the end of John chapter 16. Uh, Jesus is at the end of his uh, earthly life. Uh, He is meeting with his disciples. Right after these three verses, he prays. And after he prays, he goes to the garden and goes to the cross. And these are those three verses. Jesus in conversation and he answers his disciples and says, Do you now believe? The hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each one to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. Take courage. I have conquered the world. I mentioned uh, by email and then again in person last week that Last Tuesday, my wife and I were traveling uh, down to the Mississippi Gulf Coast, about 500 miles away, uh, so that I would have the opportunity to officiate the funeral of a friend and someone who was really a father figure uh, to me. Uh, he was, it, it, it lived a lot of years. It was uh, an old man. It was actually uh, suffering from dementia. His body had, uh, um, had fallen apart. It wasn't surprising that he died, uh, but it was... Um, It was an important moment to be with his family and to be there and to honor his life. Uh, His name was Jim McVeigh. uh, And in fact, actually, 18 years ago, I had a chance to write his story, to write the biography of his life. You see a little uh, picture there of of Colonel McVeigh. Uh, And um, I want to tell you just a little bit about him. I titled it, as you can see, The Fighting Never Stops, which was a little ironic last week. But anyway, um, his... um, his life was just characterized from day one with, uh, with fighting. He was born in 1931, so he was born just as the Depression was, uh, was really happening. He grew up in poverty. Uh, he grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, and he said that they lived on the poorest street in town. He said it got poorer the further you went down the street, and we lived in the last house. So he grew up facing uh, physical poverty among his family, but it was more than that when it comes to fighting uh, with him. Uh, His parents had uh, twin daughters followed by eight consecutive sons and then a baby daughter. So they had 11, they had a football-sized family uh, and right in the middle, eight consecutive sons. And they were all, uh, probably the best way to say it was mean. They were, uh, they, were, they were tough. They were fighters. They did some of that in terms of like golden gloves with boxing gloves on. But they did a lot of the other kind too. They had a reputation uh, around that area. They were called the Fighting McVeighs. Uh, I heard a story that there was a manager of a bowling alley once that said, when the McVeigh boys all walked in, you could hear a pin drop. That's funny, because it was a bowling alley, and he said, when they walked in, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, but he didn't mean it like the bowling pins. He meant that literally they were trouble wherever they went. So he was a kid during World War II. He was watching what was happening on a national stage. And he saw these these heroes, these people that were fighting against uh, against Hitler in Germany, fighting against uh, the war in the Pacific, against uh, the Japanese. And all of these heroes were being lauded for their great courage. And he grew up thinking, I want some of that. When he was a young adult then, when he was 18 years old, he joined the army. And as he joined the army, uh, he went into the tail end of the Korean conflict and made it just into the tail end of that, but didn't really see a lot. And he was just really good at what he did. And he continued to advance through the stages of the army and he, he enlisted, but he made it to the end. And they said, we think you should be an officer. So they invited him to officer candidate school and he entered there and excelled and did really well. He went to his first tour in Vietnam where he was injured multiple times. He ended up being supposedly the most decorated soldier in the state of Mississippi and most states with four purple hearts and silver stars, multiple and bronze stars and many other commendations for his fight there. But through this fight, you saw this, this, this man um, emerge of being someone who was tough, right? Always in his life, he had been tough. I'll tell you one quick story. He was so good at what he did that they brought him back to officer candidate school to be in charge of what they called zero week, which was, as you've seen the movies of basic training sort of things, these guys show up wanting to be officer and his job during that first week was to be hard on them. 
and to try to get as many of them to decide that they don't really want to be an officer after all in the United States Army. So one occasion, the bus showed up, these candidates file off the bus, and he greets them. And you just picture the movie, right? He's slobbering and, and screaming in their direction as they're getting off the bus. And one of the people inexplicably decides that they want to say something to him. So you could probably imagine he goes particularly berserk about them wanting to talk to him whenever he's yelling. And then the person just crazily wants to say something else to him. So he goes nuts and, and he makes them start running and he's chasing them all over the field and he runs and runs and runs them and he comes right back and he gets back to the front. And this time when he gets back, he says, sir, I'm the bus driver. I'm, I'm not here for officer candidate school. <laughs> And he said, he had no idea that it was the bus driver, but he said, I know you're the bus driver and you don't talk to me either like that. And everybody was terrified from then on because he runs the bus drivers even. He was wildly successful in many ways, but when he came back from Vietnam, if you know your American history, after dreaming all his life of being this courageous hero, and he comes back and when he gets into the airports, people are spitting at him, people are upset with the war. His family doesn't really want to talk to him about the war. Nobody asks him about what he lived through in the war. And he lived through some terrible, terrible things. And I ended up writing his story, let me tell you why. Because 15 years after he retired from the military, post-traumatic stress kicked in. And he started having these terrible nightmares. And for the rest of his life, and he lived till he's 88 years old, he'd wake up in the middle of the night, he'd be fighting people in the middle of the night. He and his wife had to end up sleeping in separate sort of situations. There were times he put his fist through the sheetrock in his bedroom wall, fighting in his sleep. What was fascinating about him was that his most feared enemy was the psychological enemy. And that's why we ended up titling his story that because he fought all his life and he, he would fight things with his hands, but it wasn't like that ever quit for him. In fact, the thing that he was most terrified of, which was the mental enemy, was the thing that was saved for his weakest state and it's something he had to fight for the rest of his life. As I spoke at his uh, funeral last week, I was reminded that sometimes we mischaracterize the gospel into thinking that it's just about patting people on the head when instead the gospel is from start to finish all about the courage it takes to live the life that God would present for us to live. It was later in life when Jim McVeigh decided to give his life to Jesus. It happened to coincide right after the dream started. And for the rest of his life, he was a warrior, still not a warrior in the sense that he had been all his life, but his, his warrior-ness was in fighting to follow after God and trust in God. Maya Angelou says that courage is the most important virtue because without courage, you can't practice any of the other virtues consistently. One of the more familiar passages of scripture with courage is Joshua going into the promised land and inspiring the people and using that phrase over and over again, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. And the passage that we're looking at today, John chapter 16, is Jesus, who by the way, Hebrew name Yeshua, which is the same as Joshua, Yeshua, is now speaking to a different audience in a more important time and way and saying to them just before he goes to face a most cruel death, take courage. Jesus said, I am not alone in this world. Remember one of our journey statements, you're not alone on this journey pulled straight from scripture. Jesus is saying, I'm not alone because God is with me. And he said, I'm giving this information to you so that you may have peace in this world as well. So that you, in spite of all the fears and the storm around you, that you too might have peace. And then he closes. It's translated in different ways. Another translation, it says, take heart instead of take courage. For I've overcome the world. 
Because you see, we can have courage about a lot of things. Maybe it's going uh, into basic training. Maybe it is uh, facing a difficult um, uh, athletic event. Maybe it's the courage it takes to walk on stage when you're about to uh, perform in a production. There's all these different types of courage. But what the gospel is, it's not really about any of those. That trait is on full display when you actually have the courage to love. And those words don't always seem to go together, but that's the message, is that the most courageous thing you can actually do is to love. Next week, I'll give you a a, a preview. Uh, We're going to be honored next week to have uh, Fred Gray uh, come and be with us. Fred Gray is 89 years old. Um, If any of you are law, justice, and society majors, it's the Fred Gray Institute for Law, Justice, and Society here at Lipscomb. Fred Gray uh, grew up, for those of you from the Church of Christ uh, uh, tradition, he grew up in Churches of Christ. He was actually, if you see the pictures on the screen, he was Dr. King's attorney. Uh, in the 1960s, and then also you see on the other side uh, him behind Rosa Parks. He represented Rosa Parks, was right in the middle of this struggle. And that struggle, if you remember, is known for a lot of courage, of people standing up and putting themselves in situations. And Dr. King, as I'm thinking about it, especially here in Black History Month, Dr. King's message was courageous on many, many fronts, but if you're not careful, you'll miss the most courageous part of his message and his courage is on display when he said, we have to learn to love those who are mistreating us. That's where courage lies. I I looked and found an old sermon of his. This was not one of his famous uh, speeches. It wasn't one of his famous sermons. In fact, he was sick that day at his regular church at Dexter Avenue. And uh, he even opens the sermon by saying the doctors told him just to come in for the sermon and go out and don't talk to anybody. And so he came in and gave this sermon and it was about loving your enemies. And he establishes, it's not too hard to establish reading the words of Jesus that we are called to love our enemies, but he said the real question is how? How do you go about doing something as courageous as loving those who would seek to hurt you? You've got to remember that there was an assassination attempt on him before the moment he delivers this sermon, that he was eventually killed, that there were bombs, that there were all sorts of things that he faced, and he's saying how do you love the people that want to hurt you? And I want to read just a, few, uh, just a few lines, really, of what he said. He said, the first thing is you have to look in yourself, but the second thing you must do in seeking to love your enemy is to discover the element of good in your enemy. And every time you begin to hate that person and think of hating that person, realize that there's some good there. And look at those good points, which will overbalance the bad points. He said, I've said to you on many occasions that each of us is something of a schizophrenic personality. We're split up and divided against ourselves. And there's something of a civil war going on within all of our lives. There's this continual struggle that with the very structure of every individual life, there's something within all of us that causes us to cry out with Ovid, the Latin poet, I see and approve the better things of life, but the evil things I do. There's something within all of us that causes us to cry out with Plato that the human personality is like a charioteer with two headstrong horses, each wanting to go in different directions. There's something within all of us that causes us to cry out with Goethe. There's enough stuff in me to make both a gentleman and a rogue. There's something within each of us that causes us to cry out with Apostle Paul. I see and approve the better things of life, but the evil things I do. So somehow the isness of our present future or nature is out of harmony with the eternal oughtness that forever confronts us. And this is what it means. Listen, if I've lost you, come back with me. Within the best of us, there's some evil. Within the worst of us, there's some good. When we come to see this, we take a different attitude toward individuals. The person who hates you must have some good in him. And when you come to the point that you look in the face of every human being and see deep down within them what religion calls the image of God, you begin to love them in spite of. No matter what they do, you see God's image there. There's an element of goodness 
that a person can never slough off. Discover the element of good in your enemy. And as you seek to hate, find the center of goodness and place your attention there and you will take a new attitude. I said last Thursday that Jesus is kind of confusing. And you read on one hand in Matthew 5, Jesus is saying, love your enemies and turn the other cheek and walk the extra mile. And then you find him in Matthew chapter 21, same story, same person going in and turning over tables in a temple. And if we're not careful, we just pick one of those and the easy interpretation of, of one and say, this is the way you're always supposed to act or this is the way I want to act. Instead of doing the hard thing of struggling and trying to make sense of what could seem like conflicting advice. And I want to tell you just quickly this morning how I make sense for what it's worth today of such conflicting things. In Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus says, when someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn to them the other. The easy interpretation is just get beat up. I believe that Jesus was saying something different. I believe when Jesus said, when someone strikes you on the right cheek, he was picking the right cheek over the left cheek on purpose. And that what he was saying is that in a world where most people are right-handed and in a society where there were those who were in power and those who were not, that when someone uses the back of their hand because of their superior position and slaps you across the right cheek, you could just take it or you could fight back or you could choose a third path and you could turn to them the left and challenge them to see you as a human being. Or secondly, if someone sues you in court and takes your outer garment because you are poor and can't pay them, give to them your inner garment as well. And if you didn't know this, there wasn't nothing below the inner garment. And I don't know that Jesus was promoting flashing, but here's what I do think he was doing. Was saying that if you do that, who's going to be embarrassed? The person who has all this money that's taken away your underwear and would it challenge them to think about how they're treating another human being? If a Roman soldier asked you to walk with them one mile, which was the law, they couldn't make you walk more than one mile. Why don't you just keep walking past that one mile and all of a sudden the Roman soldier's now chasing you and saying, please give me my pack back. You're like, no, I got it. No problem. I don't mind. And they're going to get in trouble. And suddenly the tables are turned. So here's what I think he's saying. One is don't give someone the uh, opportunity to be cruel by just letting them beat you up. And at the same time, don't resort to their path of violence because Jesus says you love them. Don't let them go on being someone who beats you up. Don't let them go on being someone who thinks that violence is the answer. But find a creative way because you care about that person. And then way later in Matthew chapter 21, it's been used all over, the, all over the place to say, well, Jesus threw over tables. He lost his temper. It's okay for me to lose mine too. I don't think that's what's happened at all. Read the text. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is making the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He knows exactly what he's doing. He says, before they even go to town, go into town, you'll find somebody with a donkey. Here's exactly how this is going to play out. And when you read the text, he goes straight into Jerusalem, riding the donkey, which was symbolic, with people around him, which was symbolic. He goes straight into the temple and turns over the tables, which I'm saying is symbolic, and shows them that God is bringing about a new world. And I want you to know and rest assured that after Jesus left the temple, because it said he did and went back out to Bethany to spend the night, that they put the tables right back up and went right back to work. And for our theater people in the audience, I think what Jesus was doing was what you might call street theater of making a point by what he's doing here. I don't think Jesus lost his temper and was surprised by what he was doing. I think he was making a statement that God is here for all people. Because that's consistent with his message of love for 
God and love for all your neighbors. So today, the question I think comes back to us is who is the person that I don't want to love? Who is the person or the type of person or fill in the blank because all of us have them. In Jesus' day, it was people like the Samaritans. It was people like the tax collectors. It was people like the lepers. And you look to the group, and Jesus found a way to step across those lines. And if you want to say, well, Jesus didn't love the Pharisees, he went and had dinner at their house too. And so today, why I'm talking about courage is it's going to take courage for us to be a community that decides to step across those lines and love the people that we are told not to. I was asked this week by a person, wouldn't it be helpful to think some practical ways? What can we really do practically to help make this happen on a community like this? And I would just say, first of all, let's show up for each other. But secondly, enter into relationships gently. Please don't scare anybody by showing up to someone and saying, I'm going to be your best friend now, right? If there's someone that you would naturally be friends with. But third, as we enter into relationships with others and with people that we might not naturally be in relationship with, let's listen a lot. Learn to listen. Last thing I'll do, I want to tell you a quick, uh, quick story. Um, when we lived out in California, I was a part of a group that was called the Labor Exchange. I may have mentioned that somewhere along the way to some group. The Labor Exchange was a place where several homeless people congregated. It was a place where day laborers, people wanting work for a day, would show up. And it was an interesting mix of humanity that was there. And just before we moved here, it was celebrating its 25th anniversary. And so there was a celebrity uh, in Malibu who wanted to host a party for the 25th anniversary. And his name was Martin Sheen. You guys are young. You probably don't know who that is now. But there, that's him and his son, Emilio Estevez. Um, if there's any... Uh, People that like 80s movies, Emilio was famous from The Breakfast Club, or maybe you watched The Mighty Ducks. I mean, there were a couple of those things. Martin Sheen was in West Wing. I don't know. All I know is they're a big deal at one point of time, and they were there, and that's a picture from that party that night. So I want you to picture with me, because it's an enduring image in my life. Homeless people, people that have no work, wealthy people from a very wealthy city, celebrities all showing up in the same place for a party. Most people were uh, Latinx from uh, South America, Latin Central America, and so there Martin paid, and his name is actually Estevez, which is why his son's name Estevez, paid for mariachi bands, and there was food, and it was, it was this great fun. And if you look in that picture, you see a tree back there behind him. I will never forget for the rest of my life at the end of the night, it was dark and there were uh, Christmas lights kind of up. The mariachi band was playing and the homeless people got Martin Sheen out to dance and they were all dancing together. And I looked over at that tree and I saw lurking in the shadows, paparazzi. They were there to take pictures, to try to sell them to magazines of celebrities out. And I just want you to get the picture of homeless people eating food and dancing and having a party and paparazzi trying to take their picture. And that scene, to me, more than anything in my life, has exhibited what the kingdom of God might look like someday. Of people from every conceivable facet of life being in the same place, celebrating together. I just wonder if you can imagine with me a community here that would look more like that. I wonder if we have the capacity to imagine what it might look like in a world that doesn't look like that, to have one place in the world that's an island that looks as if people who are radically different learn to respect and care for each other as human beings. If you can, it'll take courage to get there. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for everybody in this room. Help everyone here to realize that they are important and loved regardless of who they are. Help us to be able to um, have the courage to reach out to each other in relationship. 
For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all. Have a good day.